Hi, this is King Diamond. You're listening to The Ratio Podcast. Stay tuned. Hello and welcome to the Ratio Podcast. I'm your host, Johnny Ray, and we're recording here live in downtown Athens, Georgia, on a beautiful uh, late October afternoon. And tonight on the podcast, we have a very special guest. We have Attila Chihar from Mayhem on the show tonight. Um, and it's a wide ranging chat that you're going to want to check out. So we'll have that coming up to you here in just a few. But first off tonight, I just want to thank everybody for all the great response to the episodes we've been putting out this month. We will also be announcing our live show coming up uh, in November. That will be on November 14th and all the date, uh, the bands will be, or the band will be announced as well as our other guests. So be looking at ratiopodcast.com or on at ratio podcast on our Instagram page and of course We're on the Facebook. So uh, also tonight, I'd want to talk about a member of the Ratio podcast, Mr. Brant Duncan. He's the the guy that has been putting in so many hard hours, uh, so much hard work on editing these episodes. Um, He's an amazing talent and just a super cool guy and a long, long time friend. So it's just so exciting to have him here working with us. Brant's also a super talented musician. He's got a band called The Haunted Head. He's also in a band called The Elegant. So Brant is just cool all the way around. And uh, we want to thank him for being a part of the Ratio Podcast and putting these episodes together. Um, So yay, Brant. But now, without further ado, Mr. Attila Chihar. All righty. Yeah. Today on the Ratio Podcast, we have one of my heroes and friends, Attila Chihar, from the Mighty Mayhem, Tormentor, and just countless others. How are you doing today, sir? Hey, thank you. Um, I'm doing really good, and it's great to be on your show journey. Uh, fucking good to yeah, yeah hear man. you. And uh, yeah, it's, um, I'm in Budapest, and... Yeah, I'm glad to glad to be on your show. Hey, man, it's an honor to have you here, and it's just good to speak with you. You know, we were talking when we got on the phone. Tell us about this new project, this new baby that you're about to unleash upon the world. It sounds like such an interesting story. All right, yeah, thanks. Well, um, yeah, what we were talking about is actually, like, what happened today, I've been, like, busy with my new baby because... Um, um, I'm I'm really like busy with music. First of all, you know, finally I'm home, and when I home, I really have to take care of this new thing, which is um, connected to music, but from a totally different aspect. And what I can explain to you, it's been my passion since my childhood. Uh, since I started to listen music, um, actually, when I started to listen, so to say, heavy metal around the age. age uh, age eight, sorry. Uh, I was already into hi-fi, you know, and sound systems. So it's like very early for me comes parallel with the music, the passion. And my parents saw me how crazy I was about it. So they even sent me to schools like that. So I ended up like having this degree of electric engineering and like in industrial acoustics fields, actually, and telecommunication, never mind. 
fuck that shit because after the university, I met this guy like 30 years ago, my friend Peter, who is, um, uh, who made his first amp when he was 10 years old, or something, Jesus eight years old. <laughs> and uh, he's like this, you know, some people born with this kind of ability. He is like this little Mozart of electronics and he's into sound systems and amplifiers and he's a music, He's crazy about music too. So it's all about music. And, um, you know, then he grown up and, uh, blah, blah, blah. He's been still doing games. Actually, he lived in the U. He's been living in the UK for like eight years on the, worked on these fields, like from the beginning of the eighties. Um, he was into high end, you know, he was one of the guys who were like bringing audio not to Hungary, which is like one of the highest in the high end of audio, you know, like right. these ends cost like fucking 10,000 of dollars, you know, just the PAs and shit, you know, Jeez. that's for like, I, but the shit is all bald. And this is interesting about sound. Like they don't, ch they didn't change so much. So the good systems are still the old valve systems. Like look at the Marshall head in guitars. The steel, you see, you see the 60, 69, or I, I don't know, models, you know, from Marshall steel, they make the same shit. And that's somehow is true for hi-fi too. But anyway, nevertheless, it's our passion was to make amps, you know, together with this guy in the last decades. I never talked about this too much in interviews because it was not so, it was my private baby, private hobby, you know, and making sun systems and trying many experiments, different, trying to approach always from a different way, not the traditional way necessary, you know, the shit. And it took years and years, and it is to cut the whole shit down now. Uh, we have amplifiers, but that's for, to me, too much, too much, you know, to deal with. But we have something else, which is my baby, too, uh, together with Peter, of course. I mean, he's the main mind behind it, but still I feel very much mine because the idea was mine too. So now we have, here we go, a speaker cable, which might sound fucking funny, and I love the bizarrity <laughs> of it, you know, that Attila from Mayhem is a fucking cable guy. Absolutely. And yes, I'm proud of it because here is the fucking shit, like I told you, I want to reach all the friends, all the music freaks like myself who has a fucking vinyl player, you know, and have a listening a stereo, still have a stereo at home, um, not just a, a Bluetooth shit, you know, because the moment you have a stereo, you can change your speaker, replace the speaker cable you have with a speaker cable I could offer. And actually speaker cables in the high end and hi-fi, high end sound, hi-fi business is a pretty big deal. There are fucking expensive speaker cables made of silver. I don't know, made of whatever. Um, they also, but they all the same physics, you know, and we are talking about something which is an invention here. And that's why I'm so proud. It's not just a cable out of something. It has, 20 years of experiment behind it and it was even not sure what we're going to end up with if it's going to be a speaker cable it's just a device or something it's so many things i could tell you this whole story for like it's another interview man but <laughs> oh, here's the great, thing man. to cut it short i have a fucking speaker cable to offer and i'm very close to the end and i'm not gonna stop now I promise I will come up with this shit within a couple of months, the latest, because uh, I'm that close now to come up with a product, you know? Well, and, fuck yeah, man. And That's... then I just want to offer, and I will send you and some of my friends, you know, and I want to start to promote it, and uh, plans that, uh, okay, I can tell you why not, but maybe like you know including limited editions with my company if i may come up with some limited box set you know people put fucking can candles in it i will put that's great you know or whatever you put in a box set but i will put my cable because that shit you when you get this candle with a mayhem logo or whatever band's logo you're not gonna burn it yeah right it's your collector's item you will leave it in the box, put it maybe on your shelf and shit. 
But the shit I offer you, I will kindly ask you in a letter to fucking try and tell me your feedback if you don't like it or if you like it, if you want. Because uh, I do it for the music. I do it for the fucking sound. Hell and yeah. I don't give a fuck what kind of music you listen, because I'm sure you listen good music if you contacted me. But even if you don't listen to music I like, I still like to support your listening, because this shit will make the sound better. And that's the whole point. And that's what I'm talking about. Hell and, yeah. Okay. And I'm ready, I'm ready to negotiate. <laughs> if you, you know, I'm ready, ready to... Um, um, go in the ring, so to say, you know, and I would like to hear people, yeah, even if you don't like it, it's cool. I want to hear that. Right you know, on. it's okay. And I mean, I if you are into music and you listen music, you know, then I think you're going to like it. Uh, that's what I think. And I could be wrong, but I want to try to see where it's going to uh, lead. And, uh, it's something like a field which is far from my normal activity because I know everything about music business in that sense. I've been playing in a band, many bands, you know, I used to promote shows and also, you know, I have a record, my own label, you know, so I have seen it pretty much from all the aspects, you know, yeah, but yeah. this is something else. This is something else, you know, still connected to music, which I love and, Music is my life now, even more, because then this passion will also merge into my profession, so to say. And I'm kind of, I think also I'm 52 now. Maybe it's the time to do this shit. Absolutely. You know? so, man. I don't know anybody that wouldn't yeah. want a, uh, a cable from Attila from Mayhem. So, I mean, just knowing your listening patterns and everything, I know how seriously you take sound. I can't wait to hear how these work, man, and, and I'll be it, first exactly. in line, um, Bro, maybe we should do another interview. I send you a cable, and we do an it, and you listen, and you know, and then we can talk about it. It's more interesting man. because because now we are talking about some. It it sounds like a bubble. I could be like I just had a joint, you know, hey, <laughs> man. Up with this shit, but actually it's not. I'm I'm damn fucking serious when I'm talking about this, and. Uh, um, I don't know. And serious like that, that seriously, I'm going to make it. And if it doesn't go anywhere, it's fine. Right. It's not my, but still, I mean, we are talking about literally decades, you know, I've okay. been into this. So, I mean, it's important yeah. uh, for me, for personally, it's important for, for myself. It's important. And also it's something when you look at yourself sometimes, you know, so in that aspect, it's important because I spend a lot of time and energy into it as a passion, you know, so I would do it anyway, but now I feel like, fuck it. Oh, I didn't yeah. know if it was going to happen. I felt it was going to happen, but now it's happening because I will come up with this shit very soon. Well, and I will should. let you know, Johnny. <laughs> yeah, man, you should. Yeah. And I mean, you should be so proud of that. I mean, the, the, like you said, three decades this has taken. So uh, I, I'm so excited yeah. to see what's going on here, man. Imagine something I've been into for decades. If, if you like, yeah, I mean, it's, I'm a music crazy, you know, people who know me, they can tell, you know, I have different stereos i have one in my kitchen two in the my one for my studio one for listening you know one for I, I don't know you know it's like um for me music maybe it's more than for the average but i know so many people love music and even if you just listen a little bit at home i just want to help that that feeling because it's something i think what this cable does and it but again we're going to talk about this in the new, in, another yeah, interview yeah, because yeah. now it's like a mumble bumble, <laughs> but it gives you another dimension, you know, it oh, gives yeah. you something, it's, it's a new shit, it's a new shit, right and on. then I cut it, and then we, we keep it, we take it from here in the next one. <laughs> right on, right on. Well, going back, you yeah. know, you mentioned three decades, let's talk about, I want to go back to the Tormentor days. Can you paint our mm -hmm. listeners a picture of what your life was like when you were creating those insane, badass songs, man? Hmm. 
Yeah, I mean, it's interesting because I was just mastering, um, you know what, I was just mastering a little bit, or it, I would not call it mastering, um, preparing uh, yesterday, and it's not ready yet, the old demo of Tormento from 87. He, oh, seventh, the, seventh Day of Doom? Yeah, the Seven Day of Doom. Shit, exactly. Yeah, man. Because um, now with the technology, and now we have uh, also I have like this audio research system, which is actually made in USA. Yeah, fucking great stuff. A D seventy, like a high end them. And you know, it's my little thing to when I do a release, I do it for myself too. And my son, you, it's it's coming up on my own label, but. Here is the thing, like my label called Saturnus Productions. I'm moving it now because it's too much again. I'm too busy with my all other stuff. So I'm, I'm moving to under Season of Mist, you know? Oh, yeah. And that's going to be a great thing because Season of Mist has like a gate. So I'm going to be kind of like a sub label or use there. I can use in this way all Season of Mist distribution you know they can do the whole shit the the whatever you know uh web store and stuff so everything's gonna be the same just much more professional much more stable but i still have that my own label there so i'm totally free whatever i want to release basically i created it to release my own shit and which is like not really some else or something special or like in this case torment or i got the right so i was thinking to do myself or we do like life eternal that mayhem record you know right. uh, with a different uh, uh, mix you know from five songs from the mysterious i mean these three i mean first of all i focus on these ones because they've been already out so now with this shifting I always use the opportunity because we, we're going to print again, you know, press again. So, um, instead I tell you, it's a little of my secret because I even don't really like to, because I'm, I fucking hate remaster, you know, right. uh, not, I mean, hate, it's maybe not the right word, but it, in a way it fucks up the original, like you, I don't know. So in this sense, when I do a release, um, I hear on a good system um, how it was supposed to sound back then. Right. And that's the difference. I don't want to sound it fucking modern. And that's why I hate these remasterings because when you, I, I love Judas Priest, you know, but you know, when you listen, like it's remastered, you hear it's more pushed to a so fucking compressor. I know the technology in studios, like the dynamic is more and shit, but I like master in my taste. I understand because that's the trend and you know, you want to listen like that and shit, but I've never been mainstream in anything, I guess. So for me, mastering which i wouldn't call mastering or back mastering not remastering say back mastering i want to go back as much as possible to the original idea of the sound and the song and especially in my music in my case you know i know how we want it or how it should be sounded instead of sound modern i want to go back to the original and um yeah you would say yeah just keep the original Right. But it's been already released, and the original um, was shit because I couldn't hear that time. Now I know more about it, so I just finally touch the original, you know, and make the original sound as it should sound the original, not sound modern. I don't know how to put it in words. Anyway, I've been doing this, and... Uh, so I would say preparing Seven Day of Doom. And uh, I'm really looking forward to these new releases because I think the sound and, and for instance, like we can fix like dropouts today without touching or fucking up the sound, which is a, it's a science. Like, right. okay, that was made from a tape. 
Yeah, a Seven Day of Doom had a cassette, but the, when it was released, that cassette was this. It was my cassette, my tape, you know, old tape. It had some dropouts because uh, we listened many times and it fucked up, you know. So those things, I don't think it hurt to take out. Why you should listen a fucking okay? It's very authentic to hear the fucking dropout in the from the old tape, but it was not the fucking intention when we did it. Right. When we did it, I didn't want to drop out. You know what I mean? Oh, so yeah. this thing can be fixed. And I don't think that hurts. The, the, because it belongs to the original idea. So stuff like that, I'm working on it. And actually, sometimes we are crazy. And with a joint, I can spend like hours going through the whole shit. We spend, you know, minute by minute or second by second almost checking sometimes if it was no drop out there, no shit. So it's going to be going back to the original in that sense, and it's going to sound much better, but not modern. I mean, you know what I mean? Oh, yeah, and not this compressed. Shit I'm doing, not compressed, not that kind of type of bullshit, but more like fixing and trying to present as much as possible the original idea of the sound and the music. Right, right. So that's what I've been doing with Life Terna now. Um, on a Domini and Seven Day of Doom, and they will come out soon. Oh, man, that's uh, exciting. I mean, I will, I will just, now they have moved to with Season of Mist. Also, it's a good thing with Season of Mist that I can use their, like, for instance, with my label here, it was so time-consuming, and it was killing me, you know, like, Luckily, the Tormentor releases, for instance, I made on vinyl, they look very nice, but I had to find this private printing company, you know, they fucked up, then I went back, they print it again, or it was like I wanted to make it very nice. It, it turned out very nice, you know, but, but for instance, I want to make uh, like um, a box set, like made like uh, look like, I don't know, a sarcophag, you know, yeah. then where the fuck to go? You know, yes. if I have someone like Season of Mist, you know, I can just tell them and they might have some ideas because they've been doing this for so many years and they made from wood box to glass box. I don't fucking know what else, you know. So um, it's like uh, I like to have this cooperation and also it gives me more opportunities to make like special releases for the future. And um, also, I'm, you know, we've been working. I mean, Mayhem was one of the first bigger release of Season of Miss 2, so it's a long relation, you know, with the yeah. label. I like Michael, too. He's cool. Never had any problem on any levels, really. So, yeah, it's cool. Well, what... And, uh, yeah, well, you were asking about something else. Like, fuck, I'm talking about, <laughs> yeah? Like, you were... No, Asking is... about how was it back in the days? So well, yeah. So um, sh should I keep going, or you have yes, something sir. else? Well? Nah, nah. Keep going. This is exactly what I want to do. This is just a conversation. So yeah. Okay. Yeah, tell... I'm always wrong. You know, I'm Mister Wrong. So don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> don't... Okay. So okay. Um. Yeah, man. I mean, yeah. That's like I already told you that recording seven day of doom was made in um, in in a fucking um, uh, cellar of an, a building and there was this military you know it was like it's just a commercial building in budapest like a block of old but block of flats and shit and it's under it's like a bunker you know, when yeah. in the second war or in the wars, there was the bombing. So it was like a bunker and there was these metal doors they opened. <clears throat> and that's how we went to the studio, which was like a fucking one or two rooms of this bunker. And there was the guy had a homemade mixer, four track. He had, a, I think we had a four track tape recorder and he had a homemade delay. And I don't know, it's actually maybe the mixer was not for track. Maybe the mix was not for channel. Maybe the mixer was more channels when I tried to call back. Yeah, could be eight 
maybe or something. But I remember the homemade mixer, uh, homemade delay, because I loved it so much. It was a digital delay, and no way I could afford that in the eighties to buy a pedal like a Boss pedal digital right. delay. Man, we were that fucked in the communism, you know. Oh, like yeah. Boss has this digital delay. Couldn't. I mean, it was my dream, but <laughs> I mean, we were poor fucks, you know. Yeah. And and so. I know it was because I told the guy, I want to make mine. I already was at this electronic school, you know. So actually, I tried to copy and I was suffering so much. And I eventually, I made it work, my shit. And a digital delay it was like a wreck. And, uh, but it was so fucking noisy, I fucked up something, of course. I was, and, and anyway, that's the gear we recorded that shit. So of course, we had to play almost everything at the same time. There was no, you know, it's like the old school. Yeah. Like made, I think we made it in one night or the whole shit, like one afternoon to the morning, you oh, know, man. and, uh, <laughs> and, uh, and then we had a cassette and I remember I bought the most expensive I could afford was like a TDK SAX, uh, 60, I think it was 60 minutes, so I could just make, was it? Yeah, TDK SAX, do you remember that shit? Oh, yeah. Anyway, it's a chrome dioxide tape, <laughs> costed like probably $10 then, you know? Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, then, that, and then that recording was like... I mean, that would be today 100 bucks, or I don't fucking know, you know, maybe more, shit, 200, yeah. I don't know, just for a fucking cassette, you know? Oh, yeah. So then, of course, we copied that, and yeah, it got fucked up by the time it got released later, you know, like 10 years later or something, when it got first released, I think. Yeah. So, yeah. You... And i tell you what, yeah, sorry. Oh, yeah, Because you, you guys, I just wanted to clarify, you guys recorded Anno Domini uh, in 1988, and it didn't get released till like, what, 95? N no. No, this is 90, this was 87. Yeah. Like we, we recorded uh, this something like, I guess, the spring of 87, Seven Day of Doom, something like that. Um, or I can't recall them, but in 87 for sure. And Anno Domini was end of 88 ah. when we recorded it. Yes. So, so it was supposed to be in 89 out. It was supposed to be out in 89 because we finished it. I remember around Christmas, like New Year's, you know, even in January, we went back to do some other, some fixing, some mix, you know. Oh, yeah. We, we did another mix, which is another shit I should release. I have other mix, you know, which is just for collectors maybe one day, you know. I oh, have a yeah. little bit different mix from Anno Domini, you know, but... Uh, for now, I just focused on the, the one you guys know as well. And also that is slightly different, you will hear, but I think for the better. And it's going for the music, absolutely. So I'm proud of this new release is coming. And going back in the years, you know, like I told you, in my, I think... I mean, I didn't tell you in your interview, but I told in other interviews too, like how it used to be. Like we started, like I was 15 and at my first show, we were, I was the, way, I was the youngest in the band. Uh, and, uh, but the others, the other guitarists, like the other guitarist was like one year older than me. So I was not that younger. They were 16 and the others were like 18, 19, whatever. And, uh, Or oh, fuck it, eighteen, yeah, seven, yeah. Never mind. <laughs> the thing is, uh, uh, we just passed this fucking. We had two songs, and we just passed this shit when they look for new talents, you know. But they were like all the bands, man. And we played two songs, the fucking crazy shit, and we passed with the vote of the audience to cut the shit short. And then we start, then we could have an opportunity to have a full show, which I have on tape, actually, the Holy first Tormentor shit. show. We had like three songs and 
we play destruction cover and something like that Sodom or some fucked up shit, you know. Hell yeah. Um, it's so wrong that you would you would love it probably. I it's would totally wrong, love it. You know? <laughs> First Tormentor show totally wrong. And then but it was wrong enough that people uh, uh, started to look after us because we were the most extreme. We just wanted to play more extreme. But there was no security and shit. And we found this guy who started to uh, book us a show, shows. So we started to play in these small fucking shitholes. And, bro, even the metal scene didn't like us. The mainstream heavy metal, they kind of separated them from black metal back in the days, you know. Oh, they yeah. didn't support so much. So we were, like, somewhere in between. And people from the punk scene, skinhead scene, fucked up. Anyone who was just fucked up, they came to see our shows. Right. So I tell you what happened. It was always fight, no security. In the fucking beginning, man, uh, like in 86, when we, towards 87, let's say 87, uh, before we made the Seven Day of Doom demo, and also after, like that period, I even have a video uh, from 87, and, but that time we have already a lot of people, but just I wanted to tell you that in the beginning, um, I couldn't see the fucking audience because I was on the stage, and it was always the same fucking 10 people or 20, I don't know, 15 in the first five meter. And the rest of the people were behind. Right. Because if you wanted to come closer to the stage, you had to fight with these guys. <laughs> right. They knew each other already. They already beat the shit out of each other. So they knew each other. But if, <laughs> you had to be part of that circle to get closer. And then it was like so fucked up shows, bro. These people was always fight, fuck up. Like once I was like, what the fuck is this smoke? They were burning like vinyls and other and like clothes, you know. So it was smoke, but not from a smoke machine. It was like a fucking PVC smoke. I was like, fuck, you know, in my face, this black shit. People were like, one time I, we were like, you know, playing in this beer factory in this other shit hall kind of thing, still in the suburb of Budapest. Was, but we had like already a lot of people because actually because of these troubles, more and more people started to come to the show and it, we just started to be famous, I guess. And uh, what happened, bro? I'm just, there was first this kind of like a disco band with a girl singing. They opened the night. I was thinking like, it's gonna be a fucking hell, you know? <laughs> and then, yeah. I'm like, who was this fucking idiot to put these poor guys here, you know? And I looked out the crowd, or I just went out a bit, and everybody was standing there, you know? And I didn't say ever, just looking like this kind of like, it was kind of like, a, you could feel in the air that it was wrong, but nobody said a word. Right. And the band finished. So I was like, all right, cool. No mate, it's okay. <laughs> so I went backstage and the other band came, which was a hard rock band called Missio. I even remember the name. It was like much older dudes, you know, we were still fucking young, of course. And they just, they just played, you know, like to me it sounded like hard rock or something. Probably it was okay. But that time I was only into extreme, so I didn't give a fuck, you know. And, um, uh, you know, I'm just sitting in the in the in the kind of backstage, was like beer room, and suddenly this door like smashing, like this guy comes in, like fuck this shit, like the other guy comes in, like they storming in the other band, like what the fuck is going on? One guy is bleeding, like what's going on? Shit. And they throw away the guitar, like fuck you, and like fuck what? And turns out that the the fucking the people went on stage and beat them up. Oh my god! And then I, yeah, <laughs> and then I heard like Thor, man, Thor, and they, you know, hit the stage like, you know, you hear oh, yeah. this, this chanting, you know. I was like, all right, let's do it, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, and that was kind of like spicy to go on stage. I remember I felt the same in Moscow when I 
went on stage like dictator or something like that. I I didn't know what to expect. Expect, you know? Yeah. Like what the fuck? These guys were beaten up, you know. So I went out, and you know what? Everything was all right. It was a great show. So I don't know what to say. Uh, people were okay then, you know. Yeah. So. But this kind of shit, how it started, and then, you know, as we got bigger and we made Anno Domini, especially after that, but of course, when we did Seven Day of Doom, we copied the tapes, you know, and selling these tape copies and people copying and all the shit. So then people start to get know our music. So more people came to the show and, and eventually this shit calmed down, you know, this big mess. That yeah. was just in the first two years. And then we had another two years. Then actually, we had big crowd, man. I easily had 700 people to 1,000, you know. I think we played in Petra where we played Mayhem. It doesn't exist anymore, the venue. It's, it holds 2,500, you know. Wow. And, and shit like that, you know. And even outdoor there, which is even bigger. So to be honest, that time we didn't get money. It was the whole system. Probably the ticket prices were different too. I don't fucking know. But anyway, um, we were not even allowed to play music officially because I was still under 18, you know, most of the time uh, of Tormentor. And, uh, but also in Hungary at that time, you had to have something called Ori or Ori. It's uh, accent which means you have to contact the state and go there and you have to learn, I don't know, Beatles songs and all this fucking shit. Or you have to learn a bunch of like folk songs or I don't know how, and then you could apply and, and you had to perform that shit, you know, to get the permission to be able to play officially. So we, it was kind of hopeless actually. So we're thinking like, how the fuck are we going to do this? And then, well, it's very different compared to Mayhem because, for instance, Mayhem, I think in the 80s, they had a few shows, you know. Right. Well, I had with Tormentor probably like 100 <laughs> or 50, 50 for sure because it's like 85, 86 to 91, yeah, five years for sure, yeah. yeah. Like, it was quite some shows, mostly in Hungary and... Uh, we had a few in Slovakia, one in Vienna, and uh, but that time nobody knew us in Austria, really. <laughs> we right. were there with Necronomicon, I think. And well, yeah, well, this that was the first time I ever played abroad. Yeah. Well, well, Tormentor gets gets your vocal ability into the hands of the Mayhem camp, and I would imagine Euronymous was a big fan of Tormentor. How, do you remember the, your first contact with those guys? Yeah, of course. Um, it is like that. Like, um, you know, we stopped in 90 because it looked hopeless. And our last show with Tormentor was huge, like outdoor. Like, I think it was like. With, I think that was also with Necronomicon, maybe, but it's like two, three thousand people, you know. Yeah. We, we were like, I don't know. I think everybody was disappointed that Honor Domini couldn't be released because that was supposed to be a record, you know, yeah. out on vinyl in 89, and it didn't happen. And by 90, everything looked shit, you know. The bands changed apart from good bands like Slayer and stuff. Uh, but you know, I mean, all these bands are good, but I didn't like that, you know, everybody gave up the satanic, the, the shit, the extreme stuff and right went on, to man. something else. I'm with you. You know that, what I mean? Man. There was this totally kind of that. shit in the, in the very end of eighties I'm talking about, you know? Yeah. Oh yeah. Mm. So I didn't hear about the other stuff. I tell you why, because we stopped with Tormentor. And I think also one of the guitarists, Attila, had to go to military because that I escaped, but he couldn't. I, because I could go to the university and then I could choose to do it after, you know? But right, if you right. didn't go to university, you, you didn't have the choice. You had to go when you were 18. 
so luckily I, I didn't have to go, but he had to go. So of course this shit stopped everything and it was a constant problem for me in those years. Because for instance, I started, I wanted to challenge myself. Instead of doing another metal band, I started Plasma Pool, which sounded at that time was for me more interesting than to do metal, like was like kind of industrial, dark, electronic in the veins of like old skinny puppy frontline assembly. Of course, we were far from them, but we tried right, our way. Right. And it was pretty, it was pretty fucking dark. And imagine for us to, to afford any synths, you know, because that's before any computer existed, you know. You had Commodore 64, which was like 64 kilobytes. I mean, I don't know if kids understand that, but basically today, if you push one button on your keyboard, that's more than 64 kilobyte <laughs> right. uh, data. Then that time, a whole fucking computer, you know. Oh, yeah. So, so, and those computers had games and even some music software that very primitive and shit, but I don't want to go there now. The thing is like uh, electronic music was a challenge and actually it's important because Atari came out uh, when we already had plasma pool with a 520 kilobyte model, which had first Cubase running, and I we used already Cubase. I remember a little bit in the studio, which was an amazing fucking thing, which is today still like you know the head of your email, you know, basically the size. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but anyway. Um, that was great. And we had shows and I love to play. And also I started to experiment with psychedelic, psychedelic drugs that age and shit. And that's when I heard from mayhem. And first I tell you what, I thought it was a joke I, because my friend told me, Hey, Attila, I then could may I'm going to contact you. Uh, they are looking for you. Like, and I was like, I, band called me and from Hungary but first of all what hit my head was like fuck again like by the way my because you know we all had this uh, stage names in Tormentor like Bestial Animal was the guitar player you know uh, George Kelly bass uh, Von Mahad Demon 2 was the on drums, you know, and my name, guess what was? It was, of course, Mayhem. So, <laughs> so I even have, I signed, <laughs> I signed, I had a signature. So I signed many books, bro. I signed books when I was 17, <laughs> like Mayhem. Never heard about Mayhem, you know, I signed. I don't know what the fuck. I, we should find those old flyers when I signed. I remember my signature with this mayhem and six 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 and inverted cross, like, but like very eighty style, you know. Yeah. And uh, um, uh, so, first I thought it's a joke, or again, you know, like what the fuck again this, you know, like. But then he told me it was a band from Norway, and uh, that they had like certain history by then and shit and all right then i was like okay that's interesting because uh, i didn't know we you know i didn't know anything about any norwegian bands basically maybe apart from aha but i didn't know that was norwegian at that time right, <laughs> you know? so it's like <laughs> i knew battery that was swedish yeah, yeah so yeah. it's like mm. So I was like, fuck, of course it's interesting. Who comes up? So he saw, show me or share my slide. Eventually I got an e a letter from Euronymous. And I must say it was a very really cool letter. It was, um, he explained a lot of things and it was type, written with a typewriter, you know, old school on a mayhem, let, like on the logo on the, 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 the page. Uh, he was really humble, really gentleman, you know, like sophisticated, you know, that was my impression when I was reading it. And his English was really, really good compared to mine. Once I had to translate all, all the time some words, you know, what yeah. it exactly wanted to say. But of course, so, I mean, 
Yeah, he explained that um, how much he adored Tormentor and that he was very interested in release of Anno Domini. And in the same time that they were, since uh, that was passed away by the time, uh, but it was actually, as I, I understood, it was not much later, actually, not not long later when he contacted me. So anyway, um, that, yeah, that he, that they were also fan, you know, of, of my voice, of course, and that if I could be interested one way or another to contribute with them, but that time AM was not as today, you know, the whole scene didn't exist. So it right. was not like offering like a fucking great job, you know, oh, it's yeah. like offering something which could be really bumpy road. <laughs> you <laughs> know, we, we, we all know that. So I was like, of course I was interested. And how could I say no for an offer from a band from abroad, you know, especially from Norway, from the West, because it was still uh, the Iron Curtain just went down, you know, wow. and I kind of got an offer from the West. It's not a job really, but it turned out to be like, well, later when we were talking about the end, we ended up like, yeah, how to do it practically that I should move there, work in their store, leave there, of course, work on music. So anyway, but first the approach was just like that, that he really wanted to do this with Tormenta and really would like to ask me if I could do it, the vocals, because that's passed away and they couldn't come up with anyone else to think about or something, you know. But it was, now I say in one way, but it was written in a, in two pages, basically, and in a very cool and cool way, actually. So then he sent me some music, and uh, because when I said, of course, uh, it was still like, I don't know, in 91, maybe. Um, so time was passing by, you know. First, he, he sent me some new uh, vinyls, like a Death Crush and a Bursum. Uh, the first bursum and yeah, uh, yeah. something like that and that was already when when i think it was that time i think when Vark joined the band because he introduced me like yeah that's the album of the guy who's gonna be the new bass player he's cool and all this shit you know right um and uh I tell you something, mm, like that crush you sent me, it was cool, but I was not shocked, so to say. Yeah. You know, I was not, I mean, okay, it's the same age as somewhere around, yeah, Seven Day of Doom and Anno Domini, in between somewhere there. It's also a demo. But we were, we've been there. I felt like I've been there already, you know? So it wasn't like, musically, it didn't felt like that big step, so to say. It sounded like a very punky record. So I was like, it's cool. We can do, I can do it, of course. But, but I was not that impressed, but I've been always futuristic. I always look for, I love I love ancient tradition and the future together. Oh, <laughs> yeah. know? So I always, I like to look ahead and I, um, um, you know, so I was not impressed. I'm sorry to say that much, but I, I still didn't turn this down. Of course, I was like, keep going. And then the boots was cooler somehow. Um, I don't know. It was all cool. You know, it's just like, I hope for something, but, no, I can cut this shit, but I'm saying because very soon I got a tape. Um, she was, I think, live in Leipzig and also which was with Dad and sounded much cooler somehow, you know, and they played new songs there already. And then I got also the tape from, I don't know, because in the same time, the guy's been working, so they got the first demos from the studio, you know, like a raw mix or something. Yeah. And when I heard that, maybe in 92 something, 
uh, late 92, fuck knows when it was. No, I think it was maybe, yeah, around 92. Because I remember clearly when I put on that tape, I was like, huh? What the fuck? It's another band. You yeah. Know? Oh, it yeah. was like... What the f- I, I was like, hold on, hold on a second. <laughs> you know, I was like that. Like, wait, okay, this is something else, you know. And actually, even I'm talking about, I got a bit of goosebumps because I remember that feeling how I was like impressed, actually. Like, oh shit, wait, this is not, is it, is it the same band or what? You know, of right. course it was the same band. It was not the question, but you know, there was like a huge, step in there to some direction which was even new for me and i must admit i never heard drumming like that before i never heard music um, con- composition like structure music structures were new the, the riffing was completely new um you know you could this open chords you know picked with like speed um you know, the whole music was really fast and in the same time, really, it was a slow motion in it, you know? Oh, yeah. And I was like, holy shit, this is now we are talking about. <laughs> so suddenly, I mean, I was already into the idea and I liked the idea, but suddenly it started to ring the bell, you know, and started to be like, oh, shit, okay, this is what I want to do for fucking sure, you know? Oh, and... Yeah. Uh, and of course, then I heard more about the stories, which made it even more spicy, you know, about um, all the shit that happened in the same time in Norway. And uh, I was like, all right, um, yeah, this is actually also by then, maybe it's also my first expressions in um, experiments with, with psychedelic drugs because you know, I came from Hungary, we didn't have any shit. So first time we heard about it, I was already like 20 and 19. And you even didn't know how to get any drugs, it didn't exist. But since I was into music, you know, I could access. So some people smuggled like very few pieces. It's not like a mafia I'm talking about, you know, it's yeah. like very inner circle of people. So for me, like to take drugs, it was like, not like go out to party, but more like it was like a shamanic, very spiritual experiment. I normally did it at home alone and only listen my stereo <laughs> of yeah. course, and traveling, traveling to somewhere. So, so yeah, it's like, um, uh, it, 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 I, I mean, I don't know how I ended up in this fucking thing, but, um, but, um, but, but yeah, like with, with Plasma Pool, I had all those first experiments, you know, on stage two. And, uh, yeah, I know why I came here because Plasma Pool was also very dark music, but, but I'm talking about when I did the psychedelic drugs and the, in the, especially in the beginning, the, um, I'm not doing them today. At least I didn't do at least. Last time I did a mushroom last summer was amazing. And that was years before I did I think again. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know if I'm going to ever do it. It was too good, you know. When it's too good, you don't want to do it again. You feel like you don't want to fuck it up, you no, know. No, no. So anyway, that time I was just like listening, man, like fucking dark, like old car in 93 like put on albums like down that record or or dog's blood rising and shit like that on acid or some shit i was like so much and i was doing my magic thoughts behind and doing my own personal things you know in a way practicing didn't do well, that's something personal i don't think about blood and shit but yeah i had some shit i'm doing i was doing so I was totally into the occult. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, when I when Mayhem approached me, that was maybe the peak of my occult times in my life. The I was so much into this dark shit, and um, now I came out because I was, after I understood this, right. <laughs> it's not the right. You know, at some point you have to, yeah, well, balance it. Start to balance these things. 
But that time I was really into this. So when I went to Norway, I, I was actually pretty much ready for that shit. Yeah. <laughs> I can tell. Even today, I, was, I remember my mind, how my thoughts, and I think it was a good timing. Uh, so, and, uh, and yeah, so, so all these stories, what I heard when I went with the guys, they couldn't really freak me out, so to say, because I was into this from another dimension in another aspect. And, right. um, and somehow it worked well, you know, and, and this is how we ended up in the studio and I recorded the album. That's pretty much that time, you know, and, and after I must say, when all this shit happened, uh, and when Euronymous died, you know, the guys and everything fallen apart. Mayhem was burned down to ashes, yeah. like a ch- like the churches almost, you know, Absolutely. just a few blocks left. And that time, man, in 97, I was also in a suicidal fucking time thing, you know, I was fucked up as fuck. So it affected everybody, you know, and uh, I can think probably that I had kids and family and shit that kept me alive because it looked, everything looked so fucked up and dark. And I felt like, you know, my first band didn't be, wasn't released. Now these guys were about to release this band. Even Bark was into releasing Plasma Pool with his label. I, everything looked bright. Now it's, <laughs> now these guys kill each other. So everything is gone. Goodbye. Thank you. And then, even my other band was robbed by the mafia, you know, because some bullshit. So Plasma Pool gone by the mafia, the bands killed each other, <laughs> you know, and I was 21 or I was 22, you know, Jeez. also, you know, and I, I had a crowd like thousand people a year before, you know, and this just still you don't understand what the fuck is going on. And I was just like losing it, you know, yeah. so. I started to take more drugs. This is typical shit. And I was close to like what you see, like all these guys dying at 27. That applied to me too. I was very dark then. (laughs) It's even not cool to talk about it because hard drugs, fuck up. Luckily, I had a family, so I couldn't go that fucked up. So I had to keep shit together. And maybe that thing and shit like that could took keep me survive, but I was losing that thing too, you know, at some point and I was falling apart. And, uh, um, um, but then I joined a boring, you know, yeah, and, yeah. Uh, in Italy and that thing started to bring me back. And also 98, I met mayhem. I already been on stage with them. Uh, <laughs> That's, that's like, yeah, it's just the end of my dark period. And then I slowly came back, you know. And so I can tell you it was a bumpy road, you know. Yeah. And even if I was first time on stage when I was 15, you know, a first tour I had really, or first I could make, think about maybe I should change my life and, and focus only on music. That was like, I was 33 maybe, you know. 34. When I went back to Mayhem, then it was no question that I have to do that. Because when you have a band like that, even you, you can't have another job, really. Like what, you know? Oh, yeah. <laughs> you can't have a job where you have to go for two weeks now, three weeks then, you know? Uh, no job can take that. And even my private job, I, I used to teach math and physics, like private, and helping the problem kids big time. It was fun as fuck, but... Uh, and I was really successful, but I couldn't do it because even then you have to be there every week. If you, you I can't just leave those kids behind, you know, and come back in a month, like keep it, you know, you have to keep it that thing. If you teach someone, it has to be on periodic, you know, oh, yeah. the structure. So, so, I mean, even that job couldn't work. So that's one of the reasons like people should understand it's like a period in every band's life when, they can tour maybe, but they still don't make money to survive. That's the hardest part because how to do it, yeah. <laughs> you know, it's like, 
And yeah, it, it took me, it, I had that too for many years, it took me some time. And this is like, that's why it's, nothing is easy. And, you know, I mean, I know nothing is easy. Everybody is fucking doing their best. But yeah. this is like, you need some luck too. Uh, of Absolutely. course, I'm, I feel, I'm very thankful for my fate and for the fans, you know, of course, the people who are listening our music and shit because this is amazing but i never thought like talking about tormentor times in 86 that hey that's very what, what is it 30 man that's thir- yeah years. 36 37 years what the fuck <laughs> you know 36 <laughs> seven years ago that we are still talking about tormentor in a, in a, in a, um interview from usa overseas yeah. <laughs> like what the fuck you know talking about that demo from 87 well, like that... oh i've been mastering it the night before you know, oh, yeah. which i wouldn't even give a fuck i shouldn't give a fuck you know i just should put it out the same maybe change a little bit change the color color of the vinyl fuck that shit yeah, man, you know, put it I, the fuck I, out. It's on, you know, there's bad copies of it on YouTube. Put out your version, man. Yeah. You know. No, it's going to be the right one. And then you will know that this is the right one because it's fixed, you know. Now I put a lot of effort to fix it because I don't want to do it again. I think I got, I like it on my high-end system. So if I like it, that's good enough. Right. <laughs> if you don't like it, that's fine. Absolutely. You know? <laughs> so. Well, this is how I release anything, bro. I mean, I have to satisfy myself. It's not easy to satisfy myself sometimes, you know. So now I, I still have, I don't know how many nights, because you can't do it all the time. After a while, I go mad, you know. Yeah, yeah. I was working on the shit. Now I need a break, you know. So yeah. it, it's going on, and it's going to come out, and I think it's going to be nice. And, uh, yeah, well, at least I'm, I'm going to like it. <laughs> One thing that I yeah. find fascinating that you mentioned, and this makes total sense, going back to the songs on uh, Day Mysterious, it you know we've yeah. hung out, me and you hung out a little bit, and we we both like to go for it every now and then, and looking at how you viewed these songs in a psychedelic viewpoint when you were creating these songs and and getting these songs in your head. It just makes so much sense now because that's the view I've always looked at those songs, almost in a psychedelic view. You know, obviously, you have, mm. you know, the black metal is one thing, but but there's, you know, you can come at that from many different angles. And I've always looked at it through that viewpoint. So, so those songs were really in that first burst of you taking acid. Uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, that's the, I mean, definitely that's the period when I had my first acid experiment, but I don't think it would apply for the whole band. Absolutely. And I'm just I, talking about actually, you. Yeah. I, it's just me. And you, you, of course, I mean, I didn't think about that in that sense, but in psychedelic, I had so much experiment in this which was that time completely new for me this astral world when you see with your third eye these things you know and like it was something like a storm for me and was everything so new and i was just crazy and dig myself to darker and darker i wanted to see what's in the end <laughs> yeah yeah and yeah. Uh, and, uh, and these things were like you know uh Actually, Plasm 4, I did acid on stage too once, or because I don't know, it was fuck, fucking crazy, man. Was, <laughs> I felt like I was in hell. Seriously, yeah. it was like I felt I lost half of my cells were dead after the show or something. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I'm not kidding. It was so fucking exhausting, so intense. And, uh, um, that time it was new, you know, it's nothing. I we didn't have any information, like nothing like today. It's yeah. completely different. We are talking about 30 years ago in Hungary. We <laughs> didn't have a 60s. We didn't have hippies. We didn't have the Woodstock or any fucking thing. Nobody knew anything about any shit, you know? So we had like you guys had in the end of 60s. That was like end of 80s. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yes. in a way. So... 
in this in this aspect at least i think how the drug started at first nobody knew what it was of course from the west we heard it was bad but you heard all your life that everything was wrong for you which turned out was good for you so of course like crazy kids we tried of course and but it was like very limited no yeah. one knew it i could even the cops, they didn't know. I, I remember I was fucked. I couldn't smoke a joint. They would know. They would like, what the fuck is this? What are you smoking, you idiot? They wouldn't even think maybe it's, a, it's weed, you know? Yeah. Or it was like, I took, I remember uh, cops stopped me. I was on acid and driving, of course. Well, <laughs> I was careful, but still. <laughs> um, talking to them and they were like, what the fuck, you blow this shit. I was like blowing the, the test, you know, for alcohol, but it showed zero. So they looked me strange and I was like, yeah, well, I was like having hard exams last night, didn't sleep much. Okay, fuck out, go to sleep, you know. Right. <laughs> that was it. So like they didn't think, they didn't think, they just saw something was really wrong, you know. Yeah. So um, this is where I, I come from, but this is like, that means imagine even we didn't know shit. So it's kind of interesting. And then of course, soon it became like a store, like it took a year or two and then it, everybody knew about it and came the shit in the country. But there was like this gray years or I don't know how to call it, you know? And uh, that's exactly when I got contacted in the early nineties. Uh, when I was out there and I tell you something, I was smoking weed already and uh, I was asking the guys uh, when I came to Norway and they looked me strange, like, are you a fucking hippie? You know? <laughs> and I was like, no, I'm just needed. You know, I like it. it's more for the spiritual, you know, it's better for my voice. Ah, okay. It is better for your voice. Of course, I had to say something. <laughs> yeah, know? yeah. And then later, you know, we are always joking with Necro with it because Necro was not in the band, and of course, Eronymus calls him because he smokes too. You know, like, oh yeah. Hey, hey, hey! Can you help? Like, the vocalist needs. He can't sing without the shit. Can you help him? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> And Necro is joking with you, sometimes joking with this, like, oh, fuck. The wish we would met that time, man. It's so fucking stupid we didn't meet, actually. But anyway, it is what it is. But, yeah, I probably had smoked his shit already. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I remember. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I didn't know, of course. It's just later turned out that we, when we got to know each other, like, years after, you know. So, anyway, yeah, that's the shit, you know, and... Well, now that... Yeah, in 1998, I already played with them one song, Girls School, right. in Italy. Really? Right on. Mm-hmm. Well, now that Necro... Now First they... time Italy, they have played in Italy. Yeah? Well, well so? now, this is... Uh, the three studio albums you have produced since returning to Mayhem, you guys. I mean, it's created a vibrant new phase of Mayhem. What are some of the songs in this that uh, that you're most proud of in this incredible run you guys are on right now? Oh, well, um, I don't know. I my taste is special, you know. I think always, I always think like Mayhem should sound like something like really far away and really, 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 really fucked up somehow. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know why. Yeah. That was my idea about it. That's my, uh, that's my vision about it. That's my call. Therefore, probably I would pick up Ordo because that's still something like the closest in my vision to how rusty and how wrong yet perfect something should be, you know? Absolutely. And, uh, and, but, but so it's a hard thing because even for me, I must admit, it's probably more pleasurable even for myself to play the songs for the latest record, you know, from Diamond live. For sure it's more fun. Yeah. But I still like the other. <laughs> you, even if it's against my fun, you know, I would still fucking do that. But I know it would be so punishing to play music only like that, you know, for yeah. people. And uh, that somehow, so that's what I'm saying. My personal taste, it's not necessary, but 
people <laughs> like. So I, but it's not a compromise. I just understand it. And, and with the esoteric warfare, which I also fucking love, um, we tried to make it a little bit easier, but it's still, and it was a transmission because, you know, Morten joined the band and Rune left the band. So that's a major change actually in my life or the band's life. And you change like a driving force. So it was like composer and stuff, you know? Yeah. So of course it took some time to find at least the right person to replace him. And, uh, that was a transition album. And I think it's still really good. And both those albums are interesting for me. And before I go there, uh, we hardly play any songs from that these days, which I'm going to bring up at some point, but not now maybe, but we should come back to that with the band too, to a little bit go back to that era. But anyway, we came out with Diamond, which was before the COVID. And I think it's a great record. I like the the riffs and everything and I could sing like a more uh, I like like Thor also inspired me you know a producer guy um, and of course Morten and, and everybody you know who wrote everybody did something on the album which was really good so in many aspects it's a great record and I like that I could sing like um, use more spectrum of my voice, you know, on the latest album. So it, that has good things too. But to me, that's a little bit more too much accessible, <laughs> right. you know, that's my dumb. But then again, that's just me because my best friend tells me, Attila, what the fuck you are talking about? It's a fucking great album. And I'm like, I know, I'm sorry, <laughs> you know, and I know. It's... And I, I agree. It's, it's awesome. I like it too. And I must agree. It's great. But, for me, I like when things are very bizarre, <laughs> you know, that that's me. And, uh, anyway, hard to pick, you know, uh, it's, it's hard to, yeah, hard to say. I mean, also those old records, you know, like order at KO, uh, it's 2007 that's actually like an inversion of a Freemason slogan. But today everybody is talking about conspiracy theories and shit. But that time it was, it even didn't, I even never heard that word that time. Right, <laughs> that word right. came off there. And so I think it was pretty much ahead of time. And I like that because today make an album called Order of KO would be very cheesy in my book. However, it would be much more accurate and appropriate for the times. Right. So it was a little bit ahead of time. Also, I was not sure what I'm dealing with. So I was really careful how to put my lyrics together. And that was my first, probably also I liked that album because that was the first time, first album I made with Mayhem when I came back, you know. So of course it's always like you have the first tour, it has the most memories, yeah? Yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah. It's always like that. Even you have much greater tours later, you still remember the first ones. But then again, I think Ordo will stand forever in my book and welcome to be that record. I mean, there was not much re repeated. It was like almost like some fucked up fusion black metal. I don't know. <laughs> you know Ordo. I love it. Ordo, Ordo is one of my favorite of your records, and it just feels like you get tossed into this black hole, this void. Dude, this... it's not like you listen every night. You yeah. know, it's something for a special. It's an album for, but when you listen, you're gonna. Li if you give the right attention and the right, if you put it on the right time in the right place, I think it's gonna work. And that thing is gonna remain, you know, in my book because. I like when it's something is special like that somehow. But then again, it's just me, you know. And yeah. even I, and, and, and you know, if I have to choose what to pick up tonight, Ordo or Diamond, probably I would put up Diamond because right. that's for my mood. So Ordo is like a special thing somehow, I think, to listen, you know. 
you should listen it pitch black dark or dark room you know to get the right effect you know, absolutely <laughs> I, li- I like to listen to yeah, it on, yeah. i like to listen to it on mushrooms i've done that it's it's a it's a fun yeah lesson yeah it could that, be interesting so. Um, Could be interesting. I can imagine. <laughs> I don't know. I never tried, but yeah. <laughs> All right. <laughs> well, well, what's next for Mayhem? Man, we are uh, still playing. Uh, COVID fucked us up. Like, uh, we just came up with Diamond, and um, we had the European tour, and we just, played and a, a small Asian tour when COVID hit us and we couldn't do the US tour, was cancelled and blah blah blah. But I mean everybody was fucked up. It's no point to talk about. Oh yeah. But in our case, uh I know we all uh hold on. But in our case was even worse because uh we just came up with a new record. We were just about tour touring that so then we came out with uh, with the EP, you know, oh, yeah. the atavistic disorder, and then uh, just to keep the things alive. Even that was not planned like that. It's all about COVID, and now we are trying to finish with the COVID tour, and playing. But bro, it's so fucking good to be back. And oh yeah, the US tour. The US tour was great. We had actually uh, in in March, and I love to play in US these days. I don't know, something cool happens there for us or between us, uh, like us and the fans or our music somehow. Um, Europe was shittier, a European tour, but I think it's also because of the COVID. Like in Europe, you know, all the countries have different laws and shit. Yeah. It's different still than from US, you know. In US, you guys say it's over then pretty much sooner or later everybody agrees it's over here it's still some fucker still keep going right, <laughs> you right, know or right. whatever it is how it works so that was more tricky and now we played in vegas was fucking great however uh we had technical problems unfortunately but still the show and everybody was fucking cool it was amazing and yeah, yeah that was cool fucking thing so I don't know. I think Mayhem is doing well. For now, we are also better in the band. Like, uh, of course, we always have, you know, it's like a fucked up wedding. Yeah. Too old, too long. And <laughs> had parents, you know, arguing. So it's like that. <laughs> you know, arguing about the coffee. So it's like that thing, you know. So but calm down, the whole shit calm down. Um, yeah, I think just going more comfortable. Uh, we had to play, we just played in LA, it was a weird show actually in the sunshine. I was there. Which is yes. very rare. <laughs> you were there, of course. Yes, yes. <laughs> and, uh, I don't know how was the show, but uh, to me it was, I was fucking like, holy shit, with, with me, I mean, never do this shit, but you know, I, I just, I like to play for the sun and was kind of very b- bizarre, somehow fit to California, I don't know, but it was strange, but to me, you know, sun is important, yeah. uh, as in spiritual world, uh, it's a very important thing, actually, it's not just a fucking atomic ball or what the fuck ever it is, they call it, it's more than that. So from a spiritual aspect, it was actually a good experiment to play for the sun. It's very rare happens that we can play in the daylight or it doesn't fit to our music. So I had my good drive there on the show. And other than that, it looked scary before. It looked like nobody's going to be there. But at the end, there was some people, you know. There was. So I, mean, I was all right. Yeah, yeah I, cool. I, I think it was a really unique mayhem show, and I, I was just so uh, honored to be able to. That's I, for sure. Yeah, I mean, it was, it was, uh, and I think you definitely won some fans that day because I heard people talking about it the rest of the day at the festival. So, um, really cool. Yeah, awesome. Well, just yeah. one more question before we let you go. You've been so kind with your time with sure. us. What projects outside of mayhem do you see yourself devoting your time to in the coming years? 
Um, of course, it's Tormentor, which is very important since, uh, I mean, not they just one type of band at the, at, at the same time, but Tormentor just came back. It's so important for me. I just realized we have to keep that alive. It's so good for the, for the people too, who are playing. We love to play. So we're going to play in Mexico in December, hopefully. And cool. that's important, but also I'm doing the project which is, it's my art project. And it was in like, it's, it's something like not a heavy metal show. It's more like ritual music. And it took me years, years and years of uh, experiments again, and a lot of work to enter this field. And eventually I hooked up with my partner, uh, like in this artist, in this artistic project, called Elena Sinina, who is uh, from Berlin, from the Gorky Theater, and she works with other stuff. Now she is not even at Gorky, I think, at the moment. But anyway, we did a project first. With, I turned up, I, I, it was also the COVID times, fucked it up. So eventually, instead of the Pergamon Museum, I was supposed to uh, make a ritual and I came up with the idea to do it on the soul site on the 21st of December in 2009 or 20. Uh, no. Yeah. In 2019. And dude, this is a fucked up story. Do you want to hear it? Hell yeah. It's crazy. I want to, hear it. I wanna, it's fucked up. Check this out. I play, I'm planning to make this ritual, which is, uh, even like acoustic music. So we were not sure what kind of music it's going to be. It was supposed to be film, but there is in Berlin, this museum called Pergamon Museum, which you can compare to like British Museum in London or the Louvre in Paris. Yeah. That thing is the Pergamon Museum in Berlin. So they have the Ishtar altar, uh, which is uh, a giant altar from Babylon like, I don't know, 5,000 years old. Jeez. And it's there, like it's stairs and shit. And with Elena, we could go to that point that we got all the, all the permissions and everything from the museum that even though that part was on renovation, so they're concerned about, you know, the security and safety shit and all this bullshit. We, I mean, she did the most part of this organization, but we got there that we could do it. I couldn't fucking wait, man. <laughs> like, Shit, do a yeah. fucking offering on a 5,000 years old, one of the biggest altar, it's the biggest altar exists from Babylon from that time, from 5,000, I can do a, an offering on the, like back in the days, the oh same day, you know, God. at the soul site. So I was of course looking forward to it and got really excited about it. And, uh, you know what happens? Here is the fucked up story. Like he, she calls me like a month before or a couple, yeah, a few weeks before everything was set. She calls me like, did you hear the news? What happened? I'm like, eh, what happened? Like some fucking crazy Christian or some sect uh, guy who thought that these museums in Berlin, they are, uh, hosting Satan, like these old relics, old sculptures from these old cultures, he considered they were belong to Satan oh. because he was some fucking idiot from yeah. some religious group. And guess what he did? When uh, no fuck, it was in the COVID. It, how the fuck was it? Was it? Was it in the COVID time? So I don't know. They opened the museums. I should double check it. But nevertheless, I think it was the, after the first COVID rave. They opened the museums and we had, we had the permission to do it because they opened the museums. It was, we, we ended up there, you know, the COVID hit us, but we could still do it. It was in the first round of the COVID. Yeah. And this guy was going around in Berlin with a spray or some shit. And he went into the museums and he sprayed with acid or I don't know what he spoiled on these old sculptures. But in many museums, 
he, he tried to ruin this artifact. Oh, my God. Jeez. So he went to Pergamon, too. So it became a big fucking media shit, of course. Big scandal. All the Muslims were like, we are closing down now. You know, people were happy finally they could go out. And then it was because of this idiot. He ruined This it. shit went down. Now, listen, and then here is the fuck of shit. This guy was turned out that he was, most likely he was this celeb from the German TV, and he was a vegan chef. Oh, my God. And you know what? I just turned vegan like a year or, I mean, I've been a vegan for three years, but I, so I, the vegan was that time still a new thing for me. So I was like, vegan chef? Huh? What the fuck? <sighs> then, you know what? Next thing turns out that he was from Turkey and I don't know why, but his name was, because in Turkey they use these names too because of Attila the Hun. His name was Attila. Right. Can you, can you imagine that? I cannot imagine. But I'm going to do this fucking ritual <laughs> in a Babylonian altar, and this fucking idiot from Turkey comes named Attila, who is a vegan chef, and he fucks up my whole thing. <laughs> so for me, it was like so fucking, you know what I felt? Like, okay, this is more serious than I thought before you know like oh, yeah. i'm going i'm going into something like a new field and obviously i will have obstacles because you know i see things not just horizontal but vertical too you know like i don't know this guy knew what he was doing or not but for sure he fucked up my performance so i thought maybe i should of course i took my consequences and approach now I mean, this all I just include <laughs> yeah. in my approach. I approach a little bit more different now to these projects. And eventually that project happened. It was moved into a crematorium, which was also cool. Like in Berlin, uh, they have the crematorium called Silent Green, which is a crematorium from the 1800s. So don't think about any Second War bullshit. Right. It's an old crematorium where they burned millions of corpses in the 17, 1800s. And it has this beautiful octagonal room. So I did a performance there. Plus I did an ancient ritual called Ara, which was also filmed, which is a um, uh, very archaic and ancient uh, cleanse ritual cleansing ritual of places so it's kind of pagan and stuff i mean pagan is a stupid word but it's like of course thousands of years old yeah, thing yeah. i'm talking about so i did that thing um around the whole island to cleanse that shit so i was good guy once in a lifetime and it's all filmed <laughs> you know and there you go. Uh, <laughs> it was filmed and it was included into this crematorium shit so the second round of that stuff is when I, when it goes ballistic, because, you know, I'm so much into ancient ruins and that's my thing. I'm going to Egypt next week and I'm going to Egypt another time this year. And, uh, I mean, yeah, obviously these things are part of my life. I'm very inspired by the ancient civilizations which I know that we don't know. <laughs> right. That's the only thing I know. But uh, the thing is, I ended up to play in the Pergamon Museum. I came back there where they have Nefertiti, uh, the famous Egyptian um, queen, yes. uh, yeah. you know, face. Um, they have like many sarcophags from Egypt there and they have plenty of amazing stuff and I ended up to do uh, this ritual music there called Blackland and uh, it's like a very special performance um, 
people were visiting in groups and it was very limited, but this is like, then again, it's like a super high uh, museum, yeah. <laughs> you know, and I played for the sculptures. So people were even not, it was not for the people. And, uh, and uh, actually Charles was involved. I invited him from Mayhem. So he was doing some percussion and you know Charles is gold, a guitar player in Mayhem. Yeah, he did yeah. some percussion stuff. And Annabelle, his friend, uh, did. She's like made this Oriental vocals background, and I was doing just ritual vocals, bro. No, no fucking mic, no speakers, in a big hall, and you could hear just the voice and these acoustic instruments and the echoes, and you know, and all these. 5,000 years or three, four, 5,000 years, whatever things all around me, you know, surrounded by this old sarcophagus, which, which may mean for me much more than for average people. Because like I told you, I, I'm just like studying myself. That, I mean, I don't study for books. I go there and study there, but Absolutely. it helps me. I try to, I have a different approach. I, I like having this spiritual aspect and approach to things, um, and I like that, and that's one of my hobby. I travel to Lebanon, I travel to Egypt, I travel to Peru or Mexico, and uh, many other places you can find good stuff, like Bolivia was amazing, like Puma Punku. Um, wherever I can do it, and I have the chance, um, and I like to understand what happened there, but I think the way to understand for me, instead of reading other people's idea, which is just came from the air, like anything other idea, because these things are double old than Christ. You know yes. what I mean? Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's like, it's hard to fucking imagine. So what we know about that, that's very, very relative in my book. And the next thing I want to do, and you guys should hear about it, please Google Everybody should Google it, listen to this radio, just this thing called publicly Pepper. It's with J uh, or G, G, yeah, like G, like, uh, like ground. Right. Yeah. yeah. Like G, uh, publicly Pepper. It's in uh, Turkey. Guys, when you read this shit and look at those ruins, come on. These are circles, look like Stonehenge in UK. I hope you heard about this. Hell like yeah, these are man. stone circles from um, fucking monoliths and with carvings. And there is this dog coming out from one of these pillars, which for you might sound funny, but please fucking Google it and look at it. Come yeah, on. Absolutely. In man. the fucking Wikipedia, in the Wikipedia, they say it's fucking. 9.5 BC means 12,000 years old. That means everything we knew so far was Akkad and Babylon was like fucking 7,000 years old. This is another 5,000 years back in time. And then we have, which we have actually between, we don't know what happened for 5,000 years. There is no, no, nothing. But then you go back 5,000 from Egypt and Akkad, according to the official history, of course, what I'm talking about, you find Kabukli Tepe with the fucking stone circles, like, like in Stonehenge kind, you know, with carvings and shit. And guess what? The people who made this shit, they buried it. Right. So, like, what the fuck, you know? Who the fuck is making and buried like this shit? If they could do it 12,000 years ago, that means the people didn't come up from the cave 11,000 years ago. Or I don't know, you need time to get there to be able to do this fucking space calendar and fucking bury it 12,000 years ago. So what I'm talking about, that anything is programmed in your mind because it's a program, because it's not true, it's a history, it's bullshit. We are right. twice old. The civilization, at least. That's a fact. This is a fucking historical fact. Never hit headline news. Shit goes headline news. This never go headline news. Of course, it might be interesting to 
people, at least us, the Western civilization or everybody, that what we believe so far, how all the bullshit, because it's at least twice old, at least. Right. You know, and that's, I don't think it's for some people, okay, who the fuck cares? For me, it matters because I think if you understand where you come from, uh, you might understand where you're gonna go, you know, because yeah, this man. is like, I mean, if you go back, that's a fucking high tech and a, a civilization with astrological knowledge um, in fucking 12,000 years ago. To me, it matters. To me, it means it's so much shit we don't know and it's so much shit to learn. So at least that gives a small hope in this fucked up life. Absolutely. That there is a small, small light. There is something, a small light still in this fucking darkness to achieve because there might be something here to fucking find. And I think it's a personal way. So no one should follow me. Everybody should follow their own instinct, but do something. I think it's just I, my opinion, because, uh, because I think it's, it's much more here going on, but we don't, that's what I personally think. But, uh, and uh, that gives me at least, at least that thought gives me a driving force, you know? So maybe it's a crazy thought and I wrong, but at least I feel there is something to search for. Also something to search for in yourself could be another topic, which called, they call it subconscious. That's a bullshit word. This is beyond conscious. Yeah. Like you have a consciousness in your body, which can move your finger, which can, control your heart attack, your breathing, your whole organs. Come on, that's a fucking system then. It's not just happens randomly. That whole fucking shit is an intelligence in us. It's not a God or anything. It's a fucking high intelligence. So it's also, I think it's important that you do the so-called meditation or something, try to understand because our brain is just a surface. But you think it's yourself or your ego, it's still the surface. Otherwise, I would understand completely what's going on when I move my fingers, you know. I right. have no fucking clue. It's like I'm in a fucking controlling a robot called body or something <laughs> with my mind. But I don't know. I mean, why if, you know, the pain, what is pain? Like the pain is just an electric impulse your nerves give in your mind. Why the fuck I can switch it off if I want? Right. Well, why the fuck I can, you know what I mean? It's like, we don't control it. It's another intelligence. And it's just said, yeah, subconscious. <laughs> sub? I wouldn't call it sub, you know. Oh, but anyway, yeah. I'm just saying, this is just my recent thoughts. And I don't want to fucking, my son space out for you guys. But I'm just going to try to say, I think there is always trying to be positive here. Like, I think, okay, nihilism is cool. But I think instead of that, it's still there is some shit to look at, you know, uh, yeah, to I... understand, to study, to learn, and to make yourself a more perfect person. Be perfect to die. That's the thing. Because that's, that's what we are looking at. And if you are not perfect to die, you will be fucked up in the moment, you know, when it's going to happen. So... That's what I can say. And uh, it's going to happen anyway, unless we find out, but it's not going to happen, most likely, well, that we find out. I'm, I mean, find out what? <laughs> you know, well, I'm stay a, here. I don't know. Well, what? Well, me and you are around the same age, and I, I find it fascinating because I, I, I agree with your, your viewpoint on this. It is something to look for mm. and to try and perfect and I feel like I've only got that yeah. in the last 10 years of my life. I've really only started to really see the other side of it. So uh, it's it's really fascinating. It's a very freeing place to be, too, I think. That, um, yeah, Johnny, yeah, I agree. It's like fucking, it could be whatever for you. I don't know. I don't want to put it in word because even I don't know what's the word for it. But I, I can tell one word. It's mysterious, you know. It's something beyond or or or... You know, it's beyond our consciousness or it's in our body. It's it's everywhere and it's not it's nothing like a religion or God or shit. No, it's, but no. it's something an intelligence. I mean I mean 
fuck, man, we could talk about this forever, you know. It's but undeniable. When you look at physics, like how they talk about like how matter turns, um, you know, like matter turns to energy, yeah? Right. That's what they say, like E, e equals M times, uh, yes, C on Q, but I don't know in English this math forms how to say, but yeah, the, the Einstein shit. So if you go further, they say what's the source of energy and they couldn't go closer than they found that the source of energy is information, you know? Yeah. And what's the source of information is intelligence. So there is an intelligence. I don't fucking know. Guys, you should, I don't want to say this is too spaced out and maybe I shouldn't say this because it's just one fucking thing I read somewhere and it made me think something like science shit. But anyway, um, I think, um, uh, the religions are blocking us from this spiritual world, man. That's oh, the I fucking agree. point. I and there's the problem. It's not like it doesn't exist. They put it in a so fucking stupid, ignorant and, and, and uniformed fucked up shit, you know, that, uh, that blocks away eventually uh, most people's senses is of real, of real uh, fucking supreme uh, information. Yeah. And supreme, it, which, which might be out there. So it's in our body. I mean, I look at a fucking fly, man. How the fuck it can fly like that? Come <laughs> yeah. on. This, I mean, yeah. Totally it right, is. Right. And they fly the same in Australia than here in Budapest. The same fucking thing, the same program. I can see, you know, the same idea, the same, uh, what you would call collective consciousness, maybe collective, not so, but beyond consciousness, but all drives these flies. They don't tell me they have that fucking brain to understand all this or whatever it is. It's another dimension we don't see because in the microscope, you're not going to find anything there, any brains. Right. Nothing. <laughs> right, know? right. However, and by the way, I just read somewhere to oppose my old fucking saying that they with the electro microscopes, they found out that, for instance, mosquitoes have eight brains and they have brains on their legs. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Wow. This is fucked up. Yes, you know what man. I'm saying? So it's always like if you think about this, there is something to achieve i mean we all can perceive this and we can all under, all can somehow understand the surface of it so i mean it's up to everybody you can just sit down and watch tv yeah, <laughs> you yeah. know, some bullshit or you can just you know use your mind and you know try to understand for yourself because one day we are face we all face with the same fate yeah. Absolutely. So that's it. Yeah. So far, it looks like that. Yeah. So anyway, bro. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, Attila, I want to thank you so much for coming on the podcast today. This is like the coolest talk ever, man. Hey, thanks, Johnny. Thanks. Fucking good. We made it. And yeah, it was good to see you both in Vegas and LA. And yeah, man, you give, you also give some good shit for us. For me, Hell <laughs> you yeah, know, man. Very, yeah, I, very uh, rememberable, and absolutely. I appreciate that a lot. So I love to bring back that memory, and also like, good to be, yeah, on your show, and yeah. Uh, hope you guys didn't fucking fall to sleep yet, or if yes, yeah, <laughs> just enjoy, enjoy your fucking flight, and yes, yeah, all right, yeah. I just. I guess I should say goodbye now. Yeah? Oh, you're perfect, man. I want to thank Attila for coming on the Ratio podcast and just sharing all those killer stories about the Tormentor days and the early uh, days that he was in mayhem. So uh, make sure you go out and check all of his music, and we'll be looking for all those exciting projects he's got coming up in the coming months. And uh, I want to thank you for tuning in tonight, and we will see you with some great episodes coming back in November, along with our live show on November 14th. So until then, stay switched on. We'll talk to you soon.